All right. I am excited to be here, not just with Lauren from Reclaim, but with John and Shannon, who are coming to us from remote locations uh, with uh, widely varying and different experiences and entirely different institutions. So you won't have just me um, and, and my uh, rambling style. I'm going to be asking them questions about everything that they've ever done in life. So with that, maybe maybe we'll start with Shannon, since you're not muted. Can you tell us just a little bit about your role, your position, stuff that's going to be pertinent to this uh, WordPress multi-site conversation? Sure. Thanks for having me. It's so exciting to be here in like the space, like, you know, I like floating around out here. I'm excited to be here. So I, I'm Shannon Hauser. I'm the Associate Director of the Digital Knowledge Center at U the University of Mary Washington. So um, if you are, you know, at all involved with Domain of One's Own or these things, you may know that it was invented at Mary Washington, uh, if you know your history. Um, but so we have a long legacy of WordPress multi-site. We started up uh, a WordPress multi-site in 2007, um, and it is still running, but is currently in the process of being replaced uh, by a newer version. And we'll probably talk a little bit about some of the reasons why those decisions are made. But we also um, have that alongside our domain of one's own, and we'll, we'll talk about those things. So I feel like I've run the gamut of like, I've, we've had a legacy system, we're spinning up new systems, we have systems side by side. So there's there's a lot of stuff going on. And I think I will play the role of Tom Woodward today in terms of rambling. So feel free at any moment to be like, okay, that was enough. Um, stop rambling. <laughs> No, beautiful, beautiful. You encapsulated one thing I will note for the viewers is Shannon actually participated in this as a student. So she yeah. has she has used the blogs in classes and has like her entire uh, undergraduate career online to some degree, yeah. <laughs> for better or worse. Right. Yes, exactly. Awesome. Awesome. John. Uh, you are also another person with kind of that mixed experience. Can you kind of set the stage for us? Yeah, yeah. So I'm John Stewart. I'm the assistant director of the Office of Digital Learning at the University of Oklahoma. And uh, we've been working with Reclaim since about 2014. And we started up with a Domain of One's Own project uh, back then. And we've added in a WordPress multi-site a couple of years ago. And so I've been working on the project basically since it started. I was one of the first users of our Domain of One's Own project when we started up. I was a graduate student. Actually, I just finished my, uh, my PhD at the time. And I was uh, using it for, for a couple of research projects and then came on board to help run it. And so I've been, uh, I've been playing in the space for about eight years now. And uh, yeah, enjoying it. It's always learning more. So I think it is, it's interesting to see that both of you started uh, from kind of the opposite positions. So at UMW, they started with multi-site, added domain on one's own, and then have reconstituted multi-site. And John is coming from a place that started with the main on one's own and is now at it multi-site. There's something about the chocolate in my peanut butter or the peanut butter in my chocolate. I had half a presentation <laughs> submitted for that, but I haven't quite finished uh, describing what that might look like. But it's, it's an interesting idea. Um, can you talk to us a little bit um, since we started with Shannon last time, maybe I'll, I'll put the pressure on John to start us. Like, what what led you to this route? So you had Domain One's Own going strongly, and you've decided to to integrate multi-site in this way. What's what's some of the drivers behind that? Yeah, a lot of it was just that with our Domain of One's Own instance, we found that maybe eighty percent of our users were using WordPress within it, and a lot of those were students who were blogging for a class and who just wanted their blog to be up and running sort of as quickly and with as minimal uh, effort as possible. And so we weren't really getting the full Domain of One's Own experience where they were playing around with the domains, uh, installing multiple subdomains, really sort of exploring that space. And so we were looking for ways just to make things easier for them. Um, if they weren't going to be, you know, sort of learning about how to how to run their own domain, then, uh, then how could we make it easier for them to focus on the content for their courses where they were working? So, a lot of these are students in journalism classes or philosophy classes or just other classes that aren't really web focused. And so WordPress multi-site was a good option for us in that it uh, speeds up the whole startup time and um, and really allows the teachers to just teach and not have to worry about 
you know, how do I help support this for my students? And so I'm still there to support students, but we found that multi-site just streamlines everything. And uh, we it, it requires a lot less effort, both on the student side and on my side uh, from a day-to-day -day basis. So that was a big part of the appeal. Shannon, is it similar for you? Are there differences? Uh, I mean, I think the reason we now put them side by side are some of the same exact reasons that John just described is that with Domain in One's Own, it's, there was not as much playing, like, you know, it, it's good for some use cases, but uh, could be a barrier for people. And also, like, we, we have top level domains at Mary Washington, so it just becomes expensive when somebody just needs it for a class to blog. It seemed like that was not the best use of potentially that resource. Um, but of course, the, this is like being the, the legacy here, Mary Washington. It's like, well, it started UMW Blogs because a domain of one's own did not. WordPress multi-site was the thing you, you had to use. It was there was no infrastructure for doing it any other way. Um, and so, uh, you know, playing around with those things has taught us a lot. Right. Like there was a big push here to have everybody. There was at one point, like every freshman should have a domain. It was like, oh, why? Like, where, where are we going with this? That realization that we need to serve people, give them a platform that is the best use for them. Um, and how do we talk about those things? So that's kind of why we ended up back at like, maybe both options would be, would be good because both options provide different things um, for people. I think that's 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 something maybe worth noting for people starting out and maybe even navigating having started either domain of one's own or with WordPress multi-site is that there isn't one right answer for any of this stuff. And it is about understanding your institution, the goals, what you can do support wise, how much does it cost? Some of the things you don't necessarily like to think about, but are part of this big picture consideration. And you can decide how many things can we really even support that way? Because you could have, I don't know, 20 different platforms probably that do slightly different things. But what's, what's going to be a maintainable, supportable, nice path um, for, for the community as a whole? And how, how do you kind of guide people into the rights, right, right tools that kind of meet their needs? Um, so, you know, I certainly think that it's a smart way to do it. Uh, I'm, I'm sitting here going, you know, uh, having been from a place that just had a multi-site and now being at a place right now where I just have a domain of one's own, I can certainly see like, you know, these are Venn diagrams of overlapping, but it is awfully nice to be able to provide both things uh, on the support side as well as the authoring side. And um, I'd be curious to know, you know, who is going to what platform primarily because we're finding you know that a lot of our institutions that have both wordpress multi-site and domain of one's own wordpress multi-site end up ends up becoming sort of that starter route or you know the route for beginners that are maybe just dipping their toes in the world of web hosting or wordpress and need a little bit of guidance you know some some recommended themes and plugins already sort of curated for them um, you know, and then at the point that they've grown into that space a little bit more and are looking for other features, you know, they might launch into cPanel, launch into Domain of One Zone at the point where they're like, you know what, this no longer fits the bill for me. So do you all have, you know, parameters in place for your WordPress multi-site to, you know, provide that structure for folks? Or, you know, are you steering beginners towards one platform over the other? Um, how is that? How are you, I guess, steering traffic, I guess, is maybe the question I'm getting at. Uh, I, yeah, I'll just go first. Um, uh, uh, in some ways, too, I've kind of been doing work based off of what John had done at OU or what in Coventry as examples of like, let's put these things side by side so that users can know that they both exist and perhaps understand a little bit more. And we went through a whole site redesign for to, to recreate a landing page that would kind of put that in front of people to give them the option to, to know that both things exist. So, I mean, we, we killed one more press multi-site and spun up another. So there's a whole new thing that was, that was happening. Um, we wanted to build back that base because actually, essentially, UMW blogs had died to death. Like they had really pushed people in domain of one's own. So people, 
I had plenty of faculty who thought like, didn't we get rid of that? I'm like, no, it's still, still there, like doing its thing. Um, so to get, uh, you know, the parameters being like, we, it's very open. Anybody can sign up. Um, but that beginner kind of route, if a professor just wants students to blog, that may be the best fit for that class. Or I, you know, we luckily I feel like have a good relationship um, with our, our faculty. Um, and like, we, we do class visits a lot. So it's like, you know what, we could come to the class and talk about both options. Actually, we could, if you're fine with students using either platform, we could talk to them about which one they might want to use. Hey, you want to just get started really easily for your class? Maybe sites at UMW is the best fit. Or, you know, uh, if you are thinking you might want to really dabble and understand and have your own identity, your own URL, maybe do it one's own. You could use it for this class, but use it beyond. Um, so kind of putting that uh, agency in, in, in front of the students. Um, and that that just comes with good partnership uh, left with a lot of our faculty who who are open to those things and, you know, would love for us to come in to, to give those options. So, And John, would you say that you have a similar sign up workflow where anyone can sign up for both? Or are you pushing folks more towards WordPress multi-site and then, you know, you're maybe requesting a cPanel account? Like, what is that experience for your end users? Yeah, yeah. So we are sort of pushing people towards the WordPress multi-site and then they can request a cPanel. And with the request on cPanel, it's really just, can you articulate the need for a cPanel? And so if they can say that I want to use HTML or I need custom JavaScript or I want to work with Omeka or Drupal or something other than WordPress, like just being able to articulate that basic point is really all we're looking for. Whereas a lot of our requests still come in and say, I need to set up a blog for this class. And I'll respond to that and say, hey, you know, WordPress multi-site is really streamlined for blogging. It's low maintenance. We take care of it for you. That might be a better option for you. But if you feel like you need the more customized experience or you need something you know, that multi-site doesn't offer, let me know and I'll go ahead and set up the, the cPanel for you. And so we try to leave it pretty open-ended. It, it's a it's a pretty low threshold uh, for getting a cPanel, but really just the expression of here's why I need the cPanel. Um, and we do still have, I'd say maybe 10 or 20% of our users are now going to a cPanel. And those people are generally coming from um, a more technical background. Maybe they're in a digital humanities class or they're in an MIS class and they need to do database work. Um, or they maybe have worked with HTML or, you know, uh, building a site before, or maybe they need, you know, a really customized uh, WordPress site. And so I ran a workshop last week where we were playing with um, just all sorts of different kinds of embeds. And one of them was embedding 3D objects. And so you have to get into the file manager system and add some JavaScript. And so it, you know, sort of obviously works better in cPanel. So we have a lot of those types of use cases that push people one way or the other. Um, but for most on a student's writing a blog for their class, we push them towards the multi-site. That's, it's interesting that you brought that up just around, you know, the users sort of gravitating towards cPanel are the ones that maybe have that technical background already in place. And that is something that we see, right, is people that are maybe just getting started and they see cPanel for the first time and it's like, whoa, you know, there's a lot going on here, which is cool, but it can be overwhelming. And so there are those use cases where it's like, okay, they go in on day one, they install WordPress, and then they only ever log into that dashboard and they never touch cPanel ever again. And, you know, if you have a lot of that, you know, maybe the multi-site, um, you know, would be more beneficial for those folks. Um, I'm curious, um, and, and Tom, if I'm stepping over you or anything, just let me know. Um, but I'm curious, you know, since both of you have both WordPress multi-site and domain of one zone, we have a lot of institutions that are have both or are considering adding one or the other. How does support work for those? You know, especially if you're marrying the two services with a landing page and you're openly saying, here are two options. How do you support users in both of those spaces? Yeah, so for us, we've streamlined it through uh, a ticketing system and it's really just tied to our email. And so for both systems, they get the same email address and then I triage the tickets as they come in. Um, but it's it's pretty straightforward. And most of the requests for support come from, um, from the cPanel users or from people who've uh, either accidentally or purposefully set up accounts in both systems. And then they sometimes get confused as to why they're not seeing something uh, when they're in one system and intending to be in the other. Um, so a lot of the support just stays on a fairly sort of rudimentary level of you have, you know, you have 
two accounts. Uh, what you're looking for is in this account, um, or it's on the level of uh, you know really helping them to dive into cPanel and understand the file management and the customization and some of those higher level concepts. With multi-site, we haven't been getting a ton of uh, requests for support. Um, and maybe that's because we built in some documentation on the front end that answers the questions beforehand, or maybe it's because it is it is so streamlined and there is sort of little opportunity for um, for breaking things. Yeah, um, we here, Mary Washington, so we have, you know, we manage a lot of stuff via a ticketing system uh, as well, but the majority of our work, so it happens with students. Uh, students are engaging with this platform more than anybody else because it's it's open and really we push it for students and their class stuff. Uh, everybody should have a digital knowledge center in, in my mind. So it's a peer, peer consulting. So most of like that kind of work, if people have questions about how to do things, students are helping other students. So we really benefit from that. Like I'll, I'll still get emails and stuff from students. Like maybe they're trying to troubleshoot and you know, whatever it's the weekend when the, the digital knowledge center is not open. Um, but it, it's, uh, it's like a mixture of, you know, uh, of things. So sometimes people email and I'm mostly handling the email cause it was just too much work to figure out how to get students to do that. Um, but the vast majority of it, students actually seem to prefer to come in and just sit down with somebody to help work through work through things, even things that are just like troubleshooting them. Like I could have resolved that in five minutes via email, but you know what? You handle that. That's great. That's a an interesting, you know, I, I really appreciate hearing, um, you know, how you all approach support requests, because of course they will always be there, right? There, anytime you, you have something like this, the questions will always come. Um, you know, but having, you know, do you all have any strategies in place for, you know, limits to your support? So being able to say, look, this is, we offer a ton here, right? cPanel has a ton of, of potential. WordPress multi-site has a ton of potential. How do you find a, a line in the sand for what you can and can't support? Um, I think one of the things that has, we've seen that has maybe worked for some institutions in, in a position like yours is saying, okay, you know, WordPress multi-site, we have parameters in place. These are the, the plugins and themes that we have vetted and we feel comfortable supporting. We can help you get up and running in this space. But if you go into more of like the exploratory zone of cPanel, you know, we can offer guidance and maybe take a look, but you may be you know, on your own in some capacity. So I'm curious if you all have to draw lines like that or, you know, have differing support models for WordPress multi-site versus cPanel. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So um, I, I think it kind of de depends. Um, so I, I would say, like, let me like kind of split this too between like students and faculty because that, that, that kind of makes a difference here. So like I will honestly say, like the the number of like students who have like gone into cPanel to do things that are outside maybe the typical things is like I can count them on my hands. They're usually con computer science majors um, and are asking around, can it do this? And like sometimes that's me just like looking up or emailing or claim being like, is this possible? Uh, you know that, that that's always good to have that in the back pocket. But it's like honestly just. It hasn't happened. I don't. So it's like there's just it, which is maybe goes to show more of like the need for a WordPress multi-site. Like people are just not exploring cPanel beyond installing WordPress. So uh, I have not really seen that much on the student side. Um, in terms of faculty support, um, I would be I would say very similar in terms of cPanel exploration. But the projects say you know if it is WordPress based or something like that could be a little bit more elaborate because right they they are trying to sustain something potentially longer term and that's where like we talk about partnership around things so say they want to like buy a plugin and install it on domain one's own i'm like you can do this but no like you purchase that plugin i will do my best to help you troubleshoot um but you've paid for that plugin so perhaps you can contact their support uh if something is weird um so really i mean we have a small crew right so it's always that Let's build together. We'll we'll do our best to help sustain, but like let's talk about sustainability plans and stuff like maybe we'll even get to that. But like if you're talking long term, 
potentially projects, which happens seems seemingly more faculty, right? Students, they build things and then they're gone. Um, but that that kind of like, what are you negotiating when you're talking about faculty projects that may need love and care? Yeah, much the same for us. And yeah, with the multi-site occasionally, if somebody is making a request that seems like it might be, you know, used more broadly across the multi-site, then we'll investigate it and look at adding in a new plugin or a new theme. But generally when somebody's requesting something like that, I'll say like, yeah, just come over to the domain of one's own and we can help you to customize it. And my support, it tends to focus more on like design and then that in initial stage of wireframing and development. Um, and so generally I've told people that, you know, if I can help you out with an hour or two or three of consultation on the front end of your site to really think through uh, what you want to build, how to build it, and then how to sustain it, then I'm happy to do that. But when it gets to the level of actually doing the building, uh, that's where we, we, you know, want the user to do it and to learn from it. And so the support stays pretty light for us. Um, I, I, I meet with people almost every day to help them, you know, fix little technical issues or, or think through the design of their site. Um, but it's really just me as the, as the support shop and, uh, and what I can do and, uh, you know, in the 40 hours a week. Well, that's, that's interesting. Cause it's kind of, it sounds like John is almost the sole point of support for a certain number of things. And Shannon is maybe the sole em full-time employee support but has a kind of extended uh, staff of students uh, with face-to-face -face meeting capabilities, which is kind of nice. Shannon, can you just real quick tell me, like, how many students? How many people are they really supporting? Do you have any rough numbers on that? Ooh, I wish I had looked this up. Uh, I definitely <laughs> have, like, the – It's we, like, look at the statistics a bunch. Yeah, um, yeah. So right now we have uh, eight consultants, uh, although we're training, we're going to be up to like 10, I think next year, because, uh, you know, so too, with, with, with the DKC, we support a lot of digital projects. So it's not just domain in one's own and sites at UMW, we're helping with video, audio, like, so we kind of run the gamut of things. But the vast majority of our consult, I can absolutely tell you more than 50% of our consultations are around domain in one's own WordPress kind of, uh, of things. Uh, so of the support we do, more than half is is around that. And I think that a lot of that is due to the complexity of domain in one's own. Uh, so I'll be curious how that shifts potentially. So we just relaunched our WordPress multi-site. And if more students are in those spaces, I imagine they're more able to navigate, the, you know, ab navigate them more fluidly, um, which is the hope. And right now we have like equal amounts. I've been kind of keeping an eye on it. Equal amounts of accounts have been created in both this semester, which is radically different than how it has been previously, where it's just like the 95% are in domain one's own and people, some people were over here in UMW blog. So I guess we'll see how that does or does not shift uh, going forward. Awesome. And since I ambushed you, Shannon, and this is like, if I was professional host, this is a nice segue into the idea of like where this project maybe lives in your organization and how that impacts how you're trying to s determine success and communicate that success. So John, maybe if you could explain, cause I think, I think your scenario is maybe interesting because it's kind of shifted a bit. Um, so if you could just talk about where does this project live and how do you communicate success uh, because of that? Yeah. So our project started off, like I said, back in about 2014 and it was when everybody was still talking about e-portfolios a lot. And, you know, to some extent we are now, um, but really, the Domain of One's Own project started off as a solution or as a, as a potential solution for ePortfolios. And so that was an initiative from our provost at OU, and um, it was implemented for senior level courses and capstone courses to be that, that ePortfolio as you end up a program. And so the uh, provost office has maintained the project over the last eight and a half years or something now. But I've actually shifted, me personally, I've shifted from the provost office to the president's office. And so while our uh, system has sort of stayed under the, the support of the provost, I'm now in the president's office. And so it's a, a weird sort of split. Um, the main, main thing that I see from all of that is that our whole, both the domain of one's own and the WordPress multi-site are very teaching focused. They're meant to be implemented into classes and most of the users are using it in a class type setting. We do have a lot of faculty who are wanting to, you know, sort of share their research on there as well, which is, is promoted and supported. But um, but most of our users come from 
uh, we're using this in a classroom as part of our teaching and sort of fits under the provost umbrella in that way. And then my support is just that, uh, that I can and that it fits into the rest of my duties. Um, but we don't have anybody who quite fully supports the idea of building out research sites. It'd be nice to work with somebody from our uh, VP uh, for research office to be able to build out, you know, sort of a, a mirror side of what I do in terms of helping to support teaching, but maybe someone else to help to support, you know, more elaborate research sites. Yeah, um, I feel like John and I are in similar situations in terms of like where we are programmatically in ter like that, that support piece, like what John just said, like uh, most of what we do is focused on that teaching and learning side, which is why it's like m sometimes tickets will get, end up at our IT help desk, but most people just come directly to us um, because it's like we we're the we're the they're, we're the support. Our our IT help desk doesn't know how to support this per se, and we haven't really engaged in those conversations because it just makes sense for us to be doing that. So I guess uh, the the short I'll try to be short um, version of like where this kind of sits is um, at Mary Washington, there was a unit formed uh, Division of Teaching and Learning Technologies uh, early 2000s-ish. Um, and it brought together a bunch of IT liaisons. Um, like, actually, we have these instructional technologists who are in these places um, fixing printers, but they also have instructional technology skills. Let's put them together and see what they can do. Eventually, you know, that all the, the things uh, that come together when you put six people who are very smart in a room uh, and all the projects, that, right, like the uh, UMW blog, so Domain One Zone all come out, spin out of that kind of work. So um, luckily, a very supportive thing here at Mary Washington for, for a long time, right, the, the strong um, digital kind of exploration uh, those things and it's kind of separate and it fell under the provost, um, although briefly under the CIO, right? All these things seem to shift depending on the politics of the time, but uh, always seemingly separate from our center for teaching, which is kind of weird. Anyway, uh, you know, get, catch me for a drink sometime. We can talk details about that. Um, but over time, so 2019, um, the unit essentially kind of collapses, like everybody complete 100% turnover. Um, start to build it back up. Uh, and then you may remember 2020 uh, when every everybody's life changed. Um, and so we're at three people when it used to be six and the needs of the institution, right? The, all these kinds of things. We're still under the provost, uh, but things I don't know, have kind of changed uh, because we have that that peer side, uh, you know, that focuses on it. We, we say that the DKC owns Domain One's own, but that's practically a function because I'm the associate director of the DKC. I, I, it's it's weird and doesn't make sense and confuses people too. It's like you have a digital learning support and digital knowledge center. What the heck's the difference? We continue to wrestle with, with what that even means. So we'll see. Well, it sounds like, you know, the one constant you can expect is <laughs> stuff to move. Yeah. And this project may live under one group at one time, another group at another time. And that gets into the idea of like, if somebody comes to you and it's like, how do you justify spending this money? What, what do you, what do you, what do you tell them? What, what, what's your rationale? Do you go with numbers? Do you go qualitative, like with examples? Like talk me through how you justify, justify this in a changing dynamic world. And we'll start with John. Yeah. Yeah. So a combination of numbers and sort of quantitative and qualitative. So we have, uh, something like 7,000 users and 8,000 websites. And that's one of the things I always point to. And the users are spread out through every college and every part of our university. And so everybody finds their own use cases. And so then I start pointing them to, um, you know, as, as we were saying, the, during COVID, we couldn't hold, you know, live events like we used to. And so our uh, art college started building up galleries of student art uh, in OU Create. And our engineers share their work through OU Create and can, you know, put 3D models up. They can do uh, all sorts of research reports in OU Create. Our journalism students learn, you know, to talk to a broader audience by writing for Create, you know, both from when they're freshmen all the way through to when they're seniors. I'm teaching a, a web design and development class. And again, being able to break and make the web uh, as a student and not worry about sort of the, the repercussions um, is a big part of it. And then. You know, most of the deans across our college have both personal and research websites and often teaching websites. And so we've really 
we're, we're integrated throughout the university. We provide a service that uh, if you took it away tomorrow, a lot of people would, would be upset and wouldn't be able to teach their classes in the same way, wouldn't be able to share their research in the same way. And uh, we really support sort of the full university mission. And so um, I don't know quite what OU would do without us at this point. I hope I, hope I don't have to find out. Uh, yeah, I think much like John just said, we're kind of deeply embedded in like the teaching and learning at this point, uh, like to take away something would like, there would just be, you know, the faculty and, and students would, would be, I think, um, kind of in a, in a, in an uproar about this, but of course we do have to do, uh, especially here, Mary Washington, because we have top level domains too, like, I, you know, we want to make sure we are doing our due diligence and staying on top of that maintenance and care of making sure we're paying attention to getting accounts out. So I would say too, like this is maybe where WordPress multi-site can slightly advantage you just on the per user cost. <laughs> uh, you you want to pay attention, but it's not the same level of paying attention to what cPanel add on the top of top level domains. But uh, you know, I think some of that is just sitting down and pulling out the statistics. Like I had to do that last year and. I like, you know, gave it to the provost. It's like, you know, nine out of 10 of our users are students. And we really couch this as something that's like, this is something that if a student engages with Domain of One's Own, say really well, or just learning web stuff, that makes them marketable. And so like, right, there's a big focus right now, like at, at Mary Washington, we're in the middle of like launching a thing that's like the after, what is after Mary Washington? The, the desire to make um, a, potentially a liberal arts school where that like a degree from there marketable. Like, so, and this is, you know, digital people, like this kind of stuff, like feels like an easy win that makes like everybody happy. It's like, yes, that sounds like a good skill people should have and engage in whether or not they do it well is another, another matter, but it's, it seems like people think it's important even if they don't understand why it's important. Uh, so we have that going, going for us. <laughs> I think, um, that's maybe a, a, also a good transition into this idea of, you know, long-term plans for these projects, long-term sustainability. You know, you mentioned um, this being a great marketing tool, tool for students after they graduate. So how long do those sites stay online to be that marketing space for them, to be that digital space for them after they graduate? Do they take it with them? You know, there are so many, I mean, anytime you get into web hosting <laughs> in general, there are so many questions around that and there's no perfect answer. But, um, you know, Shannon, especially UMW coming from a place of having UMW blogs, which was successful for many years, and then at one day saying, okay, you know, this is no longer serving us the way that we need, you know, we need to start fresh. So how, and this is a question for both of you all, how do you make decisions to, you know, keep these projects sustainable, um, especially WordPress multi-site, you know, the idea of archiving versus deleting versus, you know, it's, Talk to me about those plans or thinking, you know, um, where you all are now. Uh, yeah, I think that it's, uh, we're still developing that. I think with Domain One's Own, it's much easier for us, uh, especially with students. Like we give them 90 days post-graduation to migrate and we do things to try to set them up uh, because it does cost us just so much to do that. Um, we just have to, and that makes too, like, you know, it is a domain of one's own. The whole point is that you take this with you. Go, go, like, you know, we, we uh, say that like it's a good thing. Like, we don't lock you into an e-portfolio system or other things that you can't, you could take this and you own it. Um, you know, now you can pay for it. <laughs> uh, but multi-site, on the other hand, I think we are still wrestling, which is what happened to UMW Blogs. Like, there's so much stuff there. But, and, you know, they went at it with a mindset that's like, we'll have this for forever. Let's not worry about managing or keeping this stuff. Like, you know, if sites die, that's that's how that goes, which is maybe not the worst strategy. I don't know. Like, you know, in the grand scheme of costs over time, I guess if you were really, if you were really precious about like how much money you had, you maybe you had to really pay attention to those things. Uh, it seems like multi-site seems a bit more scalable in terms of that, that like, potential cost factor. Now things dying in multi-site because plugins, that's, I don't, that's why I think having two platforms kind of helps with that. Like 
complex projects now go live on domain of one's own. They don't live on multi-site anymore, which is one of the problems with our old multi-site is that there was really complex pro projects there uh, going on. So uh, I think we're in the, still in the stages and I'd love to hear, you know, maybe what John has to say like about this of what do, we thought we wanted to delete things and maybe we do. It's like maybe hello worlds, like go through a regular kind of deletion where nobody ever, they don't engage in it, but you know, deleting things becomes complicated because say a student has an account and they've written for themselves, but then they've added stuff to a class. Uh, like who's to like, if I delete their stuff, like not just their stuff, their posts are gone from their teacher site. It's, it gets a little bit weird and wonky when you're kind of in the multi-site uh, environment. So. Yeah. Yeah. Similar answer for us. And a lot of it's tied into um, both of our systems are tied into our single sign on. And so um, IT shuts off single sign on for students and faculty who leave the university about six months after they leave OU. And so at that point, users would have a hard time logging into our systems. That doesn't automatically delete their WordPress multi-site or their domain of one's own projects, but they would have a hard time logging into them. And so generally I, I give them the same warning, especially with domain of one's own, that when you leave OU, I'll help you to transition that domain off onto you know, a separate server or over to reclaim or wherever else you'd like to. Uh, with multi-site, we right now are leaving the sites up, but I am wanting to yeah, build out a better strategy for archiving and also for the idea of, of having sites that are sort of purposely ephemeral. And so I think maybe adding something into the sign-up sheet of, I just want to use this multi-site for one semester or for one year, and then um, you know automatically deleting those sites or notifying people and saying, hey, you know, have you changed your mind? Um, but the idea that a lot of students do just want a multi-site for a class and then would be happy for it to go away, I think would be one strategy for, you know, sort of uh, minimizing or, or cleaning uh, both multi-site and domains over time. Um, I do like the idea also of, of pulling some of this down and making it um, flat files. So switching over from multi-site or domains to, you know, just flat HTML, and we could archive things a little bit that way, and they'd be a little bit more sustainable and that we wouldn't have to worry about PHP changes and JavaScript changes and the rest. Um, but yeah, still a work in progress as to how we maintain all of that. I do, to Shannon's point, I do go through occasionally though and delete, you know, the hello worlds. Um, but that's sort of a, a laborious process in that I check each of those users and make sure it's not just a hello world. Maybe there's a hello world WordPress site in a domain of one's own, but maybe there's also a custom HTML or Python or some other kind of site sort of sitting next to it. And I don't want to accidentally delete somebody's, you know, actual project um, just because I'm deleting a unused uh, WordPress at the same time. And Tom, I know you might have a, another question here, but I did want to just comment on that similar to kind of some of the scripting that we can do to, um, you know, deprovision cPanel accounts in bulk. I think, you know, our infrastructure team has been working on scripts to be able to say, okay, how many hello worlds do we have in this multi-site and getting a list of those users to say, okay, here's at least a starting point to say, like you were saying, John, you know, to reach out to those folks and say, is this something you're still using? You know, do, are you, have you changed your mind? Do you want to keep this, you know, and at least put folks on, you know, on two sides of the coin, essentially to say, okay, these are the ones that we can deprovision safely and not really have to worry about removing, you know, a history of work. Um, so, yeah, I agree though. It's, it's kind of like hitting a moving target. There's no, you know, perfect way to <laughs> archive or, um, you know, clean up these, these sites. I think it just, you know, it's kind of up to each community to decide, you know, at what point is this useful and at what point is this no longer useful? Uh, yeah, I want to chime in real quick. I think one thing that makes us very fortunate in terms of domain in one's own here is that at some point in the past, somebody worked with our enterprise people to put together a report that pulls in stuff coming out of domain in one's own and uh, student information. So I can like hit a report that's like shows me all active students if they've graduated. Like this is, I couldn't do what I do with graduation every year without this like super important report that somebody decided it should be done um, probably because of management reasons. So make, if you are doing those things, like work with the people, find the people at your institution that can help you do that work um, because that, that saves me so much time because it gives me a place to start from knowing, knowing those things, um, you know, so I would love actually something like that for my, for the multi-site, uh, it exists for me for domain of one's own, but it's like, 
yeah, I don't know how I would, I would be hours. It's already hours of work for me to, to call and go through those things. Uh, I can't imagine doing it, trying to do it manually. I don't know. That'd be, that'd be, I'd really like it if we had that. I, I do get reports from our IT of accounts that have been deprovisioned each month. And then I manually check those against our systems. Um, but it'd be nice if that was a bit more integrated. And we, for whatever reason, my reports uh, of those deprovisioned accounts miss accounts sometimes. And so occasionally I'll find out several years after somebody's left OU that they're not at OU anymore and that I need to, uh, to figure out what to do with their account. Well, this does get into the bigger picture stuff, like who are your key partners? What's the key data? And it's, it's a bit on, we probably have a number of people who are either early in this stage with their WordPress multi-site or trying to figure out what they want to do. And I know it can be like trying to like figure out like what car to buy. You could spend probably hours on like thinking about upholstery and stuff like that. But you having done this, lived through a couple different cycles and with great depth and experience, where would you suggest people spend the most energy and time when they start to think through this project? For me, the, the part that I enjoy doing the most and the part that um, I think merits the most time is working with the faculty and thinking about how you're going to work with faculty to be able to support um, them as users and their students as users. And so that's where, you know, whether it's it's the people who are running the multi-site um, or, you know, partners in the library or in the Center for Teaching Excellence or, uh, you know, Center for Teaching Knowledge, um, you know, wherever those people are, you know, working through those processes to be able to support faculty and rolling these things out. And you just don't want to get into the normal ed tech trap of, you know, giving everybody an iPad, but with no idea as to what to do with it. Um, and, you know, same thing applies for uh, a WordPress site. So that's the, I think, the more fun end, or the, the part that is more interesting as somebody in educational technology to me. The the other partners are more on the IT side and uh, and some of those administrative sides of just how do we how do we keep this clean? How do we keep it, um, you know, keep track of our users? Uh, how do we integrate this into the rest of the university systems? Um, those are, you know, a bit more technical and, and less exciting, but necessary uh, just to prevent the, the sort of bloating and degradation of the system over time. Yeah, I think my answer is similar similar to John's, but it's just so, I think, contingent about you, the context of where where you are. Um, like I've had, I've had kind of people reach out to, to me about like, they're like thinking about starting domain of one's own and uh, like, what should they do? And then they tell me, it's like, well, this is being started in our small digital humanity center. How do we, I'm like, your, like your goals, like, you know, sound different than our goals. So I can like advise you on some things, but you are maybe you're a faculty member who is part-time doing this maybe you should be partnership partnering more fully with your IT department to have to manage the support queue. Can do you have good relationships with them so that they can maybe uh, handle like very baseline things, uh, you know, com coming in, uh, do, you know, maybe that's essential here. It is because we already had a unit that does like has that level of expertise. That's, that wasn't important to us. I mean, we have a relationship with our help desk. Like they know, how to forward those things. They deal with the single sign-on problems because that's that's not us. Uh, but, you know, for us, our partnerships with faculty um, and the students are are the most important. What are, what are our faculty's interests around these things? Um, and, okay, they our faculty are really, they're not as interested in building elaborate projects. They want their students to do it. Oh, that means we need to have really good student support, which is why the Digital Knowledge Center was created. DTLT was like, we are helping faculty so much do interesting so many interesting things with their students um stu our faculty are overwhelmed and it's preventing them from engaging maybe we need something that uh, and then those students we were then reaching out to dtlt and they're like we don't we don't have time in our day for this we're, we're faculty development maybe we need something that students can help students right so that that was an evolving thing um so it's really who who is going to be using it? How do you serve them? And that just really contextual and grows over time, right? The DKC didn't exist. Um, you know, uh, it took years for that to the idea to to come fully around because they saw if we're going to get people to faculty more faculty to engage in this, there we want to help them go. Hey, you don't need to be experts in this. You know, you can point your students to us. Um, so uh, it's con contextual based on uh, need.
Well, I really like it. it's it's you know it's it's the same thing we do in so many other ways, right? It's backwards design. What are our goals? What's it going to take to support that? Like the idea that you get faculty engagement by supporting students may not be intuitive initially, but it is a thing that you can start to see when you kind of dive down into it. Why aren't more faculty using it? Because they feel they have to be experts, you know. So how do we take that off their plate? Um, you know, I think that those conversations are interesting. They're unique in each individual organization. I think that's one of the things people struggle with is often, you know, you want the answers, you want some concrete stuff, but it does vary so differently depending on the goals and who you have to support it. And just between the two of you, I mean, it's just radically different places, but still with a lot of overlaps conceptually in terms of what's happening and how it's being done, which I... I think I find it interesting. So another thing that usually comes up with people considering this or even in the throes of it is like the fear, uncertainty, doubt level, right? So like before we get to like, what's the most amazing thing you've seen? Maybe like, what's the worst thing that has happened to you and, and how did you deal with it? John, you want to start us off? I was trying to think of the worst thing that's happened on the multi-site side. I and mean, just because we'd had, already had the experience with domains, we learned a lot. And so with the multi-site side, the hard part was just, just the initial setup, just deciding sort of what plugins and what themes to support and how we would, we would do that. Um, then rolling it out, we'd already built the networks of faculty that knew to talk to us, the, the classes that we're using the course. And so it was, it was a pretty easy rollout just because of the angle that we were coming from. Uh, we tend to have more sort of exciting and interesting like failures on the domain side where people delete accounts by accident. I've deleted accounts thinking that a user wasn't there anymore, wasn't using it anymore, and then having to go, you know, restore that, figure out how to back it up. Um, so yeah, the absolute deletion of something is, is, I guess, my big fear, but normally there are backups of everything. And, um, and I always think that, you know, breaking things is an opportunity for learning. And I, I don't remember having broken anything or even our users haven't broken anything so badly that we couldn't repair it or couldn't um, couldn't recover it in some way. Um, so yeah, I, I don't remember any real horror experiences. I just remember, yeah, various learning opportunities of, well, we broke that in an interesting way. Uh, how do we <laughs> how do we not do that again? But I I like what you're saying though, John, because I think it kind of gets to that idea of taking the scary factor out of it. You know, it's like we can't break it. Like, even if you think the worst happens, you delete it, we can, we can get it back, you know? And so that was one of the really empowering things for me when I was first starting out in these spaces is just like, okay, even if I press the wrong button, you know, it's all okay. Um, anyway, I didn't mean to cut you off, Shannon, but I, I like that approach. As, as just in that moment of thinking also, I guess the worst, or not the worst experiences, but some of the worst were when I agreed to things without really thinking it through. And so <laughs> The, the biggest challenges have been where I said like, oh yeah, I'll help you build that site. And then it, it ended up being, you know, uh, a site with like 2000 items in it. And I had to like manually do data cleanup for it. And it took me, you know, three weeks instead of the two hours that I thought it would take. So yeah, agreeing to the scope on things before you get started on it is, uh, is the main thing I've learned. Uh, yeah, I echo what John just said, all that, all those kinds of things. One layer I think will add on to this, which could be the consideration, sustainability, but no one can predict the future, right? How, who would have seen unit six going down to three, pandemic, all these kinds of things. One thing is because we were early on and did a lot of experimenting, I've had to, I encountered a lot of bespoke things that were done here, experimental things that we didn't know were happening, right? Like not long after like the unit reformed itself, two or three of us are out of the office and the front page of domain in one's own just goes down and we're like, what is going on? I mean, it's because like that existed on DigitalOcean and not with Reclaim Hosting because they were, do right? Like there was all these like little precious things that were interesting. Like it was interesting, but it, there was, we didn't know about them. And so therefore we kept in kind of un uncovering this stuff. So we've tried to lean into being standardized as much as possible just for that sustainability aspect. What I get run over by a bus, it'd be much easier for somebody else to kind of take stuff over. If if they need to reach out to Reclaim Hosting, the Reclaim Hosting can easily look and understand what's going on because it's a standard setup. Not like, um, 
yeah, there are some weird custom stuff that is happening. So um, we'll try to help you. But uh, yeah, just I, that's hard. We want to experiment and do cool things, but also like who who might have to carry that on uh, and and do things uh, that that would that would be another layer of the complexity in terms of like doing interesting things. Uh, not to say you shouldn't, but also you know weigh that with like who else will have to manage this project. Well, I think that 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 idea of putting the the little custom precious things not in your main standardized system is yeah. is a key learning <laughs> learning object for for everybody. I think you know, like when I look back at like what I left the poor people at VCU with, I'm like, oh dear, that <laughs> that that that's really bad because we we did everything and customized all sorts of crazy things uh even the login system there is custom because uh gardner campbell didn't like buddy press's login system so we wrote a custom one on top of buddy press um so you know you get into some interesting things but that idea let's keep this system clear and understood and structured and we'll put the special things in these places where they're at least contained and don't spread, you know, to, to the other stuff. And I think that that maybe that's maybe that's the only thing I need to to, to reference for the rest of my life. Um, but yeah, well, well put. Sure. All right. We're get, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, we want to talk about the best things uh, like, you know, yeah, yeah. Get the best. Thing. Thing. So, <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, uh, yeah, I, and I, I, I kind of um, want to just talk. I think like the best things are obviously, and I'm guessing John will like this, are not like the technological successes. It's like, oh, like I successfully deprovisioned a bunch of people, whatever. I don't know. It's about like the cool stuff people do with your platform, right? Like that is always the most exciting part. Um, and there was one, uh, I mean, there's, I mean, with the history we have here at Barry Washington, and there's like hundreds of projects I could um you know, refer to, but one uh, that I've kind of recently, you know, that I show a lot is this um, class called the Geographies of Children, taught by one of our professors. Well, so like, it's this is multifaceted. So like, uh, and she's taught this multiple times. This is like, I can't remember which iteration of it, it maybe 2018. So like what she does, it's a small, it's like a, a class where students, eight to 12 of them are in this class, they're, they're doing field research about the geographies of children. So not only are they learning how to be human geographers and do this research, she's like, okay, it's also important for us to, we're gonna do this research and then we're gonna put it up online so people could see this research. Add on to that the complexities you're dealing with children. So you've gotta be, you're publishing things about children online, like the privacy, important. like it's basically like teaching these students to wrestle with all the things real human geographers have to deal with. Um, and I heard the way she goes about building a site. It's like a co. She doesn't. She's like, we're gonna build the site. Let's go. Like she's like, it is like she just tells them that that's what they're gonna do. And like I, I think it's blown the minds of several faculty that it's just like you don't like scaffold them into doing it. She so she owns this domain, right? Like it's on her. Like that that piece of it. She's just like, no, go. Let's figure out what's the best way. Let's just do it. And she they manage to blow off a site every every time. Uh, and She's told me several students have gotten jobs because they can point to this work. I did this, like, look at it. It's just, I, it's one of my favorite things. So it just like, it's the full, I, I fed it. I know it must be a really intense and like impactful, you know, experience for the students that go through all, all of this in a class. So I, I do just love it. Awesome. John, you want to you want to share this because we're, we're closing in on time and I want to make sure we end strong on positive notes. Yeah, yeah, it was just uh, a lot of great experiences. And like I said, I've been working on it for like eight years. One of my favorite was working with the School of Art on this gallery that they put together during COVID. And like I said, we couldn't have the normal. Normally, the students would use our Museum of Art and build out their own like actual physical gallery, but we couldn't do that. And so I got to work with the art students. And they came up with all of these crazy designs and all of these things that they wanted to do. And I was like, yeah, I, I think we can do that. And so, you know, just working with them from the design angle and then helping them to sort of um, produce it was a lot of fun. Uh, working with the architects 
on some of the weird stuff they want to do sometimes. Just uh, I enjoy the the strange projects and when people are asking for things that I hadn't thought of before or for like really beautiful things that I just don't have that level of, of eye, um, but I can help them to to make it real online is always the most fun for me. And then the other side of that is when I discover things that people have built totally without me and without me knowing about it as they were doing it. And I'm like, oh, this is brilliant. I wish I'd known when they were building this, but I'm glad they were able to do it on their own without me at all. And so uh, both participating in these things and then discovering uh, the pieces that people do, you know, totally on their own is, is fantastic. Well, it really is. It's it's amazing. And, and you look pedagogically even you're you know the two examples that we're showing are coming from very different spaces with very different disciplines and very different intents and one of my own personal favorites still is like a field botany site that is still in use like after i think eight or nine years there's i just looked to see if they were still throwing things in there and they are which i find amazing am i embarrassed visually about how it works now yes i am uh, could I make it much more amazing and awesome now? I could, but it keeps doing the thing it was intended to do, which is bring field experiences into the digital thing in a simple way for people. Um, and, you know, just for the fun of it, there you go, Taylor. Um, you know, and it's, it's, it's like that, I think. Like when you can meet that person in the right space or have that person just take something totally and do it, um, you know, so there are thousands and thousands of field botany um, images up there now. And it just cracks me up that it continues to churn on without any sort of support. Because um, I know nobody has touched it in years, um, which is, you know, it's just kind of cool. And I think like this, this kind of paints hopefully a spectrum of, of different institutions different people, different origins, different futures, but they kind of weave back and forth in exciting ways that, 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 that I think inform one another. So, you know, if you get nothing else out of this conversation, you now know John Stewart's name, you know, now Shannon's, Shannon's name, I'm going to leave out her last name in case she doesn't want to be identified further. Uh, <laughs> and you know, my name. So these are people I think that are interested and eager to talk about this stuff and, and to, help people when they can. Um, I don't want to commit anyone, but like, it's part of it. It's like, this is cool stuff. We care about it. We like to share what we're able to do. Shannon, you want to give your last name? Yeah, it's Hauser. Uh, I mean, <laughs> all my handle is Schauser. So one could probably easy, easily infer if you find me on the Discord or any other social media, it's usually that. Well, thank you all uh, so much because we're one minute from the end time, which I think is is pretty amazing, right? Um, and so, you know, we, we'll be, uh, I know a number of us are in the Discord. Um, so if you have questions, you want to see additional examples, I know I love to share. I'm going to probably pop yeah. a bunch of other sites. Like, there's awesome. just so many. I, I like, you know, this. It, that's the exciting thing about these kinds of projects. They can just range so wildly and i think showing people examples is like can be the most inspiring thing oh i can i can do this like you know that's how it can apply to my class or absolutely and the key element so thank you again really appreciate it and you know maybe we'll see you at the reclaim open conference right all right